Today, the Tropicana Casino and Hotel closes its doors for good, almost exactly 67 years after it opened. The thing is, should we care? Today on CityCast Las Vegas, I sit down with my co-host and lifelong Las Vegan David Figler to talk about the legacy of the Tropicana and whether casinos are worthy of historical preservation. It's Tuesday, April 2nd. I'm Sarah Lohman, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. David, the Tropicana is closing today. Do you care? Short answer is I probably would have some years ago, but I've grown sort of immune to the nostalgia of a imploding hotel because we've gone through it so many times. You're hardened. I'm hardened to it. Yeah. I mean, I feel bad for all the people who have direct memories. I guess I do have some, too. But Mm -hmm. like the workers who were there all those years and maybe even some of their guests and customers who really were loyal to it, I guess it's losing something important to them. But, yeah, I mean, this is now the standard. This is the uh, rule, not the exception. Vegas likes to build, build, build. We've lost some good ones. It is sad. old, Old gals go down. I mean, I think I saw on your Instagram not too long ago you were there and you were already like, okay, this doesn't have the sparkle that it that it had before. Am I remembering that accurately? Yeah, I went for a special event not terribly yeah. long ago and had a great time at the event. But, you know, part of the allure of going to that particular show was sort of knowing in my heart of hearts that the Tropicana wasn't long for the world. And this was before the announcement that the right. uh, A's had settled on it. That the official date was set. Well, Correct. David, so, you know, you call me our official resident food historian. You're sort of our unofficial resident Vegas historian. So what is the legacy of the Tropicana? At one time, did it really matter to Las Vegas? Uh, sure, 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 sure. I mean, it was part of the storied, you know, beginnings of glamorous and fabulous Las Vegas. And mm. I, I, I could go on forever and ever, but what I'm going to do is, like, essentially give you a drunk history. Right. Um, so... Yeah, comes online 1957, which is before my time. And I know that right from the start, uh, it was sort of a a glamour puss. Uh, Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, it was uh, the vision of somebody who was involved in being the vision behind the original Fountain Blue in Florida. Okay. Yeah, they were kind of trying to replicate that vibe, that Fountain Blue vibe, believe it or not, back in 1957. 57. It opened up after the Flamingo, correct? And the Flamingo correct. was kind of the first hotel with the old mob money in there that was going, as opposed to like Wild Rest rodeo aesthetic, was going for like L.A. luxury. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you okay. know, uh, uh, there's a lot of misconception that the Flamingo was kind of the first thing on the strip. But you're right. The way that you frame it, it was kind of like that new style. It was the yeah. first of those. And it was early on. Uh, So now we're already into the 50s now, uh, well into the 50s now, and the Tropicana comes online, and other hotels quickly follow and quickly, you know, and preceded it, like the Riviera preceded it. So uh, at the time, it cost $15 million to build, which was the most expensive property in Las Vegas to date. Mm, Uh, And I did my little little computer calculator because I knew that you might ask me in um, (laughs) current dollars, that would have been about $166 million. Okay. And for a frame of reference, the actual Fountain Blue that just opened up uh, in December was uh, a reported $3.7 billion. Yeah. I mean, to be fair to you, David, I I wouldn't have asked that because inflation is actually really tough to calculate. It's not it as is. easy as, as so like, I just the went calculator with the, how the, online. Yeah. I, just, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I relied on the internet to do that figuring for me because I'm, no, I'm no though. economist. That said... So as I understand, Tropicana was quite beautiful and it had all the elegant lines that one would expect of a property of that Mm -hmm. expense in that era. Very mid-century modern. Yeah. um, They did have some problems from the start. There were suggestions of organized crime. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were some shootings that made that even more relevant. The Nevada Gaming Control Board kind of got involved. Anyway, they wound up um, selling that property. And that's the thing about the Tropicana as far as its legacy is it has been in a lot of different hands over the years, Mm -hmm. Um, but never really swooped up by the big corporate uh, entities here in in town, so Mm -hmm. that your MGMs and your Caesars Entertainments and stuff. I guess the heyday of the Tropicana really, once they started kind of getting steered correctly, 
uh, was under a guy named J.K. Housels, who mm -hmm. is sort of a storied gambling guy in Las Vegas. Um, and in the 1960s, it was considered to be uh, the peak of elegance. Uh, it even gets mentioned in uh, Diamonds Are Forever, the Bond movie. And oh. Sean Connery's like, I hear the Tropicana is pretty cool or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, that's not the exact direct quote. Nailed it. Yeah, I did nail it. And plus the accent was perfect. That was yeah. Scottish on point. Um, but, you know, they couldn't really keep up. Uh, and, and the new Vegas was sort of being ushered in by places like Caesars Palace and all the Kirkorian properties and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they had done numerous renovations that... I think we're fairly pedestrian compared to its original origins. And that's when people really stopped, you know, caring so much about it. However, they did have sort of a lifeline with entertainment, which I know you know about some mm. of the stuff that was going on over at, uh, at the Tropicana over the years. Yeah, it's got an interesting uh, kind of footnote, I would say, from about a decade ago. It really was a hub for LGBTQ culture, um, mm. uh, tourist mm -hmm. culture. I don't think it was particularly relevant to the culture within the city. But again, anyone is welcome to correct me. But they were known for hosting the Sin City Classic, which was sort of this multi-resort, multi-place, like many, many sort of competitive sports that it was for specifically a conference for the LGBTQ community. Um, they hosted a lot of events in that regard. It was sort of known, if you dig through Google reviews, as like mm. the gay hotel. Um, mm. But it also seems like that legacy has kind of faded away. And honestly, like, it seems like the Flamingo was sort of picking that up as being, like, you know, David, how every hotel on the Strip sort of has this secret audience that if you don't yeah. know, you know, that was the Tropicana um, particularly for the gay community, but it seems more broad than that to LGBTQIA. Um, and now it seems to be more the flamingo. But I want to ask you, too, in one sentence, what would you say the Trop's legacy is as it crumbles I, to the ground? I think entertainment-wise, you can't ignore the impact of the Follies Berger, oh, uh, sure. which was the longest-running review in to date in Las Vegas history. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that any... Review can last as long as that one did. It debuted uh, in 1959, wow. and it ultimately closed for good in 2009. Really gave us that like showgirl imagery. And the thing about like the Follies Berger, it was imported directly from France. Wow, uh, it was fairly storied. I mean, it was a topless review. It wasn't the first topless review. It wasn't the best one, but sure. it was fairly epic in a lot of the ways that it was presented. And it it, it had a, a sort of variety component to it, along with the you know elaborate uh, choreographed headpiece showgirl sort of things. Uh, it's where uh, Siegfried and Roy uh, debuted as oh, a wow. variety act. And uh, another magician who had a long run on the strip in the 1980s, Lance Burton. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and and to this day still, you know, presents smaller shows uh, like Purple Rain uh, and the comedy shows. And I know Murray Sawchuck had performed there quite a bit. So, you know, it was kind of one of those places that, um, you know, had a venue that if you were interested in sort of that Vegas style entertainment, it was always in some form or another present in the Tropicana. Let's talk about one of my favorite annual events in the Valley, Home and History Las Vegas. It's happening April 25th through 28th, and it's presented by the Nevada Preservation Foundation. This is a four-day event series that offers a unique opportunity to step inside and explore some of the iconic homes and venues that have played a significant role in shaping Las Vegas. There are more than 40 events scheduled, and I'm going to four in two days because I'm a crazy person. I'm going to go on a walking tour of the vintage architecture of motor hotels, a class on how to make my home a mid-century oasis, a tiki cocktail event in a mid-century tiki house, and a behind the scenes at the Clark County Museum. Tickets are at nevadapreservation.org and tours do sell out, so get on it. And I'll see you there. And I'm kind of wondering if maybe we aren't doing this sort of decommissioning a little bit better this time around. Because rather than just blasting it to the ground, we know that the Tropicana is working with the Neon Museum, the mm. Showgirl Museum, UNLV, to preserve parts of its history. So cool. And uh, Rob, over at the newsletter, was just saying the Neon Museum is going to light the Tropicana sign that they have on property on April 3rd as well when the building closes down. So it, that's exciting to me because I am a preservationist at heart, right? Um, but I think that the problem with Vegas and 
and, you know, what we've done before, just implode casinos and burn the documents and call, the, call, call that a day, is we have a hard time deciding what's nostalgia and what's worthy of historical preservation. I think that's mm. a bigger problem with mid-century architecture in America. We're just starting to appreciate that. So yeah. what, do you, what do you think? Like, when is something nostalgia and when is it worthy of historical preservation? Well, I really appreciate the context that um, entities like the Neon Museum have created Mm -hmm. because I remember when the dunes went down, uh, which was one of the first, uh, you know, in the the beginning of the implosion era, I believe it was like around probably 1993 is my guess. Um, It was very elaborate and they staged like uh, firing cannonballs from the Treasure Island, you know, mock. uh, and And then they landed on the dunes and blew it up. And I, re- I, I recently revisited that footage and I was watching and I was like, oh, that was really actually kind of cool and I love the spectacle. And then I saw them blow the sign up, the dunes, the classic wow. dune sign. It was still working. It was still lit. It was still beautiful. And it's like, yeah, like now, back then, it maybe was thought of as pure nostalgia and we don't need it, no import. But the Neon Museum, with its educational aspects to it, with its preservation and restoration, has made that more relevant. So I think that I don't want to say that you need sort of a, a formalized or an academic context to determine what is important. But I think you just need to be, like I always say about our city, a little more mindful. I agree. And, you know, a real heartbreak for me is um, the Fiesta Henderson. So when I moved to Las Vegas, as I was driving here at night, I saw that immense, gorgeous Fiesta Henderson sign, you know, as I was coming off the 215. I you like loved that sign? it. I missed okay. it. It's, it was huge. It was like a marker of my neighborhood and my arrival here. And then mm. I watched them dismantle it. And I, you know... I know people tried to preserve it, but it kind of I think it probably was more affordable for them to sell it back to the boneyard. This is this is just me philosophizing here, but it like pains me. Yeah. And when we talk about boneyard is like they basically, you know, stripped it for pieces. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that is a financial choice, I'm sure, whether to donate something to neon and sometimes donate the money to restore these signs yeah. or to, to sell it for parts. Maybe you need that. So, I mean, how should we celebrate these old casinos like the, both the ones that have left us and yeah. the ones that we still have and we're hanging on to. Well, it's a little harder with the ones that are long gone, right? Yeah. Um, you just hope that the the the, the collectors out there, or the people, the scavengers, the salvagers uh, have a little bit of peace because I think there are important stories. Like, look, we could spend hours talking about little stories that happen inside the Tropicana that now will be lost forever as yeah. it's replaced by something that takes new memories possibly. Um, And we could also look at, you know, look, I always say this, Sarah, um, you you could throw any casino out at me on the strip and I could tell you something there that has either historical or, as they like to say, sentimental value that's worth preserving for future generations to discuss or to admire. In the ones that still exist. Yeah. On the strip and not downtown. Well, or or downtown. I mean, really, the two, you know, okay. the Strip and Glitter Gulch. Absolutely. Luxor. Uh, so Luxor, if it's still around, they had the most remarkable theme rides when they first opened up. And there was like this oh, yeah, video. Oh, like yeah, Nile ride. Yeah. Yeah. So like, and, and it was the cheapest, like, Egyptian-esque artifacts that they had. And I just think that all that kitsch should absolutely be preserved. I mean, if there's a way to preserve the inclinator or to like video map the inclinator, uh, that's such an interesting thing. But I think the obvious one is the friggin' Luxor light, the beam yeah. that beckons the aliens and on bats the alike. Yeah. yeah, so there's so many parts of, of the Luxor. All right, well, I also said we didn't even mention that they are using technology to map the hotel rooms of the Tropicana. So again, oh, more than yes. ever before, we're having these different ways to preserve spaces that will be lost. Okay, but let's move up the strip. How about the Bellagio? The Chiluli flowers need to be preserved mm-hmm. 100%. Mm-hmm. Right when you go into the lobby there, those beautiful, beautiful flowers that, uh, you know, are just so fragile and precious and gorgeous. I would hate to see anything happen to those, and I want them to stay in Las Vegas. Uh, but, of course, you know, like, I would say uh, any of the technology from the fountains, like that stuff, oh, wow. you yeah. have to, like, you know, remember what we did here. You know, this is really interesting. I once got to take a tour of the underbelly of the fountains, like the inner workings. 
uh, and you saw where all the canoes are and all the stuff yeah, that yeah. they use to maintain it. And it's fascinating. And I would hate to see that gone. Uh, but I could go on and on about Bellagio. I think Bellagio is really a, a modern marvel of, of Las Vegas. OK, last one. Circus Circus. <laughs> we hold, We did a whole episode on that, and that was an edited version. Um, I think the games themselves need to be preserved, like the tic-tac-toe. Mm. I miss some of the games that they took out that are the gone midway forever. Games. The midway games. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think components of the, the steakhouse need to be preserved. And I would love to see a computer mapping and also an endocrinologist um, do a lecture on uh, the, the buffet foods over the oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, it would definitely be those 3D murals. I mean, I know it's like oh, a little yeah, bit of like, uh, yeah, it's art, but like to have a lion tamer and the lions jumping out of the wall, it's so cool. But there's so, so many secret rooms, Sarah, and, and little, rooms. yeah, whatever they are in every casino. Like, again, we we could do an hour on any casino. I I. I Throw down the gauntlet I mean, and find stuff that you need to preserve one way or another. Casino either. Secrets sounds like yeah. a great episode. Oh, but, yeah. So how should we celebrate these spaces while they're still here with us? If Vegas is Vegas, it's just going to keep blowing things up and building new ones. So how do we celebrate what we have? Well, I, you know, a lot of that is on the property owners. It's sad because as Las Vegas becomes a little bit too corporatized for my taste. You lose a lot of that uniqueness. And in the scale of economics, uh, there does become a certain homogeneous feel in a lot of these different places. Hmm. Um, and that's why I think when events come up that are just a little freaky, you know, I got another one from the Tropicana. I once saw a pop-up show in the showroom there with Beck, and the opening what? act was Tenacious D. And it was Beck was on his Tropicalia tour. Oh, my God. And so, of course, he picked the Tropicana. And it was one of the best shows I ever saw. And I think the thing is that, you know, when casinos do actually do something like a Beck show or a Glenn Danzig show, it doesn't have to be music. It could be art. It doesn't have to be art. It could be something funky or different or weird or interesting, something that catches your eye, the revamping of Slots of Fun that we talked about, whatever. Mm -hmm. We need to go to it. People need to go to it and, uh, you know, document it. I mean, we're in the most documented time of history so far. Everyone has like the top edge technology in their pocket to record stuff. Go to these places, you know, memorialize it. Um, and then we talk about it. We, we we're creating our own oral histories about these places. And some of the artifacts shouldn't just be for the collectors, but should be for all of us to kind of take advantage yeah. of. So, yeah, yeah that's how we celebrate museum. it. That's so, how we celebrate it. So allegedly, there's going to be a baseball stadium going on this site, but also yes. a new hotel from Bally's, right? Oh, yeah. Bally's yeah, got their own problems right now, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so allegedly. So, like, if those things don't happen, what would you like to see on the site? Oh, wow. That's fantastic. I mean, I think that I, I think it needs to be a gaming property. I don't mm. think we need the diversity on the strip of economic uh, engine. Uh, but I think it should be something innovative. And I don't know, whatever we consider to be glamorous today, it should be that, but not necessarily Fountain Blue. What do you think? What about a public park? Oh, my God. Now you just one up me. I hate you. <laughs> yes, of course, a public park, a green space on the strip. <laughs> I've never seen someone get so Oh, much. you're so much better than I am. But that's, you know what? Yeah, that's why I said it, David, to make you I look bad. I get it. I know. You just want to make me look bad. But here's the thing. I'm like, more casino. And you're like, a public park? I'm yeah, like, a public oh, park. F off. We can work with the Springs Preserve. It can be part botanical park. There can oh, be my gosh, water feature be there with so some recycled great. water and some information about that. A place for people to take a break from the casinos, pr to propose marriage, and then like... Make sure there's some water, you know, sensitive trees to provide shade and an open air space. That well, would be really nice. Well, why stop there, Sarah Loman? Now I'm going to one up you. Let's just make the entire strip pedestrian friendly with green Yay! spaces. Let's I, just go there. I'm going to one up you again because at my public park, there's going to be um, kitten puppy adoptions every day. You can go meet the kittens and puppies. Um, there will also be sanctuary animals, a tiny horse. And I'm putting affordable housing all around it. <laughs> <laughs> this place sounds great <laughs> Las Vegas it's not what you think it is anymore alright David it's well, utopia thank you David see you later thanks Sarah
that's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. Hey, if you've got stories at the Tropicana, will you send them to us, please? You can text us or call and leave a voicemail numbers in the show notes. So if you enjoyed the show, talk to us. All right. And then while you're here, please subscribe to us and to our morning newsletter. Hey, Las Vegas, your stories might appear there. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Take care. Hey, Sarah. Totally not even a bonus, but I tried to figure out what the definition, well, like the translation of Follies Bergere was. Yeah. And the closest English translation to Follies Bergere is insane shepherdess. <laughs> there it is.